This is our last Sunday of kind of diverging from the Gospel of Mark. It's been a while now, so for those of you that don't know, we have been plodding our way through the Gospel of Mark and observing the life of Jesus and his disciples, and we're going to get back to that next Sunday. But for this Sunday, it's our last Sunday, and this is our business meeting this afternoon. Oh, Matt's not here. Oh, there's Matt. Yeah, Matt, I punked you out earlier. It was Matt that had the great idea to schedule today's business meeting and potluck during Super Bowl Sunday. So you can you can dine and dash. It's okay. Um, but thank you for coming and really the business meeting. We're kind of getting back on track after not being on track for a while with kind of the COVID thing and and Jeff leaving. And so we're we're back to having a business meeting and it really is just a simple vote on a on a simple budget. So it'll only take a few minutes. But I wanted to take the opportunity to um, to talk about one last Sunday. I've been doing this uh, through the month of January. And this is the second week of February, but to kind of summarize it this morning with talking about who we are and what we are doing, specifically talking about our church here, um, Summit Lake Community Church. And this morning will be applicable to anybody and everybody here, whether you're here only for one Sunday or we'll we'll go to another church at some point in time. So it's applicable, but it's going to be in the context of of talking about yeah what we believe here what what we're what is it what our foundation is and the picture that I have up there is a is a picture of a church in the woods kind of like what we are so yeah who who are we and what are we doing out here as this in this this little church in the woods and every time a, a, a new person comes I I think my first question is always hey how'd you find us out here How'd you find us out here in the woods? Um, Because it's not necessarily a a normal place to find a church. And we have have a different congregation in that most of our congregation comes from, everybody, uh, all of our congregation comes from really three different counties, from Thurston County, from Mason County, uh, from, uh, from, what's the county? Grays Harbor. See, it's just, it's just... My wife didn't even want me to say it because that's where she's from. Brings up bad memories. And Lewis County, so I guess I guess we come from a four a four county area. So it's kind of a it's kind of a different uh, feel. And I'm gonna I'm gonna address some of that as far as kind of the the challenges that we have at, at, at our church. So we're this this church in the woods. So why church? I have on the slide there. Why church? And I'm using that as a verb, not as a noun. Why church? Why are you churching today? And I'm, I'm, I'm literally asking you that. I, I mean, we may have a little, little com, uh, conversation, but I want you to think about that. It's not a quiz question. You guys are all good. You know, most of you are good church people. They can give me a good church answer as, as far as to why church. But um, churching nowadays is a little strange, especially where we're from out here. You think about our culture and um, with the advent of social media and what we have access to in our living rooms. I mean, come on, our, our jobs have now um, gone to our living rooms. I mean, m- many people in our state uh, don't even go to work anymore. So they, they work in their, in their homes. They, they're, they're really individual, kind of isolated people that can remain isolated. And you can do the same with church. And I'm not necessarily saying there's a right or a wrong way right now. That's not what I'm presenting. So I'm asking you, why do you church? Why are you churching today? Why are you here? In one sense, you can, you don't need to be. I mean, I know some of you will react to that because of the right church answer. Um, but I say that in the sense that you could get my message. You could get a, a good gospel message in the comfort of your home. And the comfort of the woods, in my case, and listen to a podcast or watch a YouTube. So yeah, why 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 church? Why are you churching today? And I hope that as we kind of go through the sermon today, it brings up yeah, what are we doing here? What what why are we churching here in this wood this this church in the woods? What does that look like? And I hope in the in the over the course of this next year that we can um, flesh some of that out because, again, we have, um, 
we, we've got some different flavors here at the church, kind of due to the dynamic of people driving from all over the place that presents some challenges. So I'm going to flesh a little bit of this out today as far as, yeah, why church? But I want to begin with kind of a summary of uh, what I've been talking about over the course of the last month. And number one here, I, I kind of had wrote this kind of like a, call it a vision statement or a mission statement, if you will, and kind of pulled it from what I've been preaching about over the course of the last month. But I've, I've written, first of all here, I just kind of have two points. It says, I say right here, we are a church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and that knowing God, which I've highlighted and emphasized quite a bit over the last few weeks, is knowing God, that he's, he's a God that is for us, that he's producing good in everything that he does and allows to happen in our life. That, that's what knowing God is. That's what we believe here. And we've looked extensively through scripture, some scripture passages. I'll, I'll show a few more this morning. But when scripture is talking about knowing God, God is presenting himself and making himself known as this kind of God right here, as a God who is producing good in everything that he does and in everything that he allows to happen in your life. The, the picture of David, which I think we talked about in the sermon, I think, uh, three weeks ago, and we've seen in Sunday school, is we're, we're seeing that uh, kind of live in, in our Sunday school and looking at the life of David. And there's some crazy things Difficult things, sinful things that David was a part of, that he experienced. And in all of it, under God's sovereignty, God, his intent for David is he's producing good in David's life. And the good mainly being that David is knowing God for God being a good God. Okay, and again, I, I have the tendency of trying to repeat every sermon of mine in the last three, three weeks, so I'm, I'm going to try to resist doing that. Um, but one of the verses that we've covered is this, this verse in Jeremiah, uh, verses in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. And it says, this is what the Lord says, don't let the wise boast or shine in their wisdom. Don't let the mighty or the strong shine in their might or the rich shine in their riches. But those who wish to shine should shine in this alone. And it says, and Jeremiah says, that they truly know me and understand that I am Yahweh. And this is where we, we've talked about this, where God is presenting himself as the God who does this right here. And it's, he says that they know and understand that I am Yahweh doing or making loving kindness and goodness. That it, through his loving kindness, he is judging. He, he is governing in a way that's different than the way people govern. And he's governing in, in, in rightness. God is the only one that can truly make the right decisions in his governance. And again, we've seen that through the life, of, just even this morning in David. David is governing. Ga David does, and he, and he does in a flawed, weak, sinful way that results in harm to people. Whereas what we see in Scripture is God keeps contrasting himself with the, the kings that people want. He, he contrasts himself to them and he says, hey, I'm, I'm a different kind of king. I'm a different kind of God and here's my promise to you. Here's my covenant to my people from the beginning to the end is you're, you're going to know me and you're going to know me as this kind of good God. And that's what... That's what Jeremiah says here. He says that they truly know me. Hey, if you're going to shine in anything, shine in this. Boast in this. Be proud of this. That you truly know me and understand that I am Yahweh. Doing, making, loving kindness and goodness. Judgment or governance. Excuse me. And rightness in the earth. For in these things I am inclined to. I am bent towards and I keep. That's what God is doing all the time. He's functioning out of his, his, his loving kindness, his rightness, and his good governance. So that, that's the knowing God piece that, that, that we are about here at our church. And it's why Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. He says, and when I came to you, brothers, I did not come to you proclaiming... Uh, 
I, I, whenever I try to read from far away, I make a mistake. That's why I keep looking down here at my technology. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Paul's saying, hey, this is what I'm about. I, I'm only proclaiming Christ to you. And why does Paul say that? You want me to keep that as a rhetorical question? What did Jesus show us in his life here on earth? The goodness of God, the loving kindness of God, the words that we just saw in Jeremiah, we see played out in flesh in the life of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. He was God with them. So Paul says, hey, I, I, and Paul knew a lot of things. I said before, Paul would have been the in-resident expert. He would have been the subject Matter expert. You get, those of you that are in the military, we call them the SMEs. The SMEs. The subject matter experts, okay? Paul was the subject matter expert on normal human righteousness. On how to live according to the letter of the law. He even said, I did it perfect, according to the way that Paul thought. And he says, nope, I'm throwing all of that away. It's rubbish. It's trash. And now I'm presenting to you that I don't know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So this is the knowing piece that we're talking about. And Jesus says, and now this is eternal. This is, this is perpetual. This is continuous life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent this is why I, I, I've used this quote from J.I. Packer that says, we never move on from the gospel. We never move on from the good news. We just move on in the gospel. We move on in the good news. And what, what I'm seeing is from First and Second Samuel to the Psalms to Isaiah to Jeremiah, all the different stories and passages that we've covered, especially over the last six months, is it, it's all merely a proclamation of the good news of God. There's no higher or advanced level of Christianity other than the good news. The good news that, that we find in Christ Jesus. And number two here, therefore, together we trust. And I'm, I'm using this, the, in the first one I, I said, I, I talked about how we are a community of believers and then here I say, therefore, together, this community of believers, we trust, and I specifically give the, the Hebrew definition of the word trust there, we go quickly to refuge in Jesus Christ, waiting, in the Hebrew definition, or grasping or binding on to him as our salvation, believing that it is he who is actually holding us. On to us. So that's these two things. The first one gets at our foundation. So the foundation is that, that we're dedicated to knowing God, that knowing that he is this, this good God, producing good in everything that he does and allows to, to happen to us. That's kind of the foundational piece. And then this, the activity piece or the action piece is, is, is what I'm getting at here in, in, in number two. That in any activity that we do at our church, whether, um, whether it's Cleanup day at the end of March prior to Easter, whether it's helping clean up at the church, whether it's having a business meeting, whether it's helping clean up um, after, after a potluck, uh, if, it's, if it's a ministry we decide to, to develop and be a part of here at our church, it, all of that is with this idea that what we're doing in that activity together is purposefully going quickly to refuge in Jesus Christ. And that's where, I mean, part of me, we don't, I don't have the, we still haven't completely put everything up after the, the Christmas stuff, as Patrick is back there waiting and Christmas stuff up there. Um, but it's like I want to get a couple other banners that, that hold this up all the time, that in, in any activity that we do, let's be reminded of the fact that we're getting together to do this right here. We're trusting in, in God, and that trusting is going quickly for, for refuge in Jesus Christ. And we're waiting, but not just sitting around waiting for the Holy Spirit to do something. 
No, we're, we're waiting with, with this Hebrew word in mind that we're, we're actually acting, we're grasping onto God himself because we realize that he's our salvation. And we believe that he's actually the one holding on to us or grasping on to us. So just like that picture with the, the toddler or the baby, I gave that, that um, picture of, um, I remember as a new dad, doing that with Caleb. Of course, I, I probably was doing that with, with a bad intent because I was by a, a pool, okay, and I was holding Caleb, and I purposefully bent over. Oh, sorry to say that, guys. I'm just a normal dad that is trying to trick people all the time, okay? So I, I lean over the pool, and I just distinctly remember being impacted by Caleb just grasp, just grasping on me. If he could have if he could have reached his arms all the way around me and intertwined his arms, he would have done that. So he believed and he was, he was acting in this way to where he was actively grasping onto me. And that's what he believed he was doing. That's what he knew he was doing. But what was the reality? I was the one holding on to him. I was the one with, with better or bigger strength than, than he had with bigger arms grasping onto him. So this whole idea is that this idea that, um, that in any activity that we do, we're going to do it with this idea that we're, we're grasping onto binding or binding onto God, knowing that he's our salvation, but believing at that same time that I'm acting and, gra- and I'm believing I'm holding on to him, I'm fully believing and knowing that he's actually the one that's holding on to me. That's a whole lot better hope than just me relying on my strength, my weak, feeble strength to hold on to God. And so Psalm 25 says this, and I just, this, this psalm has impacted me, or this particular verse has impacted me, where it says, Indeed, none who wait for you, and again, that's that Hebrew word, none who bind together, perhaps by twisting, who bind together to you, that's God, None, nobody who does that will be put to shame or nobody who does that will be disappointed. I don't know about you. I, maybe it's just that kind of, I'm at that phase in life, but I'm basically being disappointed by everything. My body, other people, sports, the weather, my cars. I two cars that don't even work in my driveway. Hunting. I mean, I can go down. You, I can. You may list more. No. <laughs> but it's providing me this clear picture that I, I hope, like with a little H, I hope in so much in this life, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get something. I'm trying to extract encouragement, hope. Um, prosperity, you name it. I'm, I'm trying to get stuff out of this life. And that's normal. And it keeps disappointing me. And it's providing a clear contrast with God himself. And to me, it proves there's a God. Jack and I were just talking just briefly about, I mean, kind of about this right before walking up here. But this, this clear picture that Really, I mean, I, I get fleeting moments of fulfillment of the little hopes that I have in this life. But increasingly, I'm disappointed all the time. And that throws me back on God. And verses like this, it says, hey, those who bind themselves together to God himself, they won't be disappointed. Why? Because it's a different kind of hope. It is a living hope that's based on something completely different. It's not based on me just wanting or waiting or hoping for my life to get better somehow. It's based on a, on a love. It's based on a goodness. It's based on a faithfulness that's different than anything I can find in this life. And to me, that little part of that message, to me, proves there's a God. Because if there's not a God that's like that, then yeah, this is all worthless. It really is. And it's hopeless. But God presents himself in a different way. He says, those who, 
who bind. And I like that idea. I love those words better than the wait word. I'm not just sitting around waiting for God to do something. I'm not sitting around waiting for God to change my life. No, I'm binding, I'm grasping onto him because he is my only refuge and strength. And when you grasp onto him like that, you're never going to be disappointed regardless of the outside circumstances. But how do we do that? How do you grasp onto him? Again, it's kind of, we talk about these things, especially these these spiritual ideas with kind of physical pictures, but yet, yeah, how, how do you do it? And it's, I, I keep on thinking, it's very simple. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast to the hope that we profess without wavering. So this, this is in the Greek, but it gives the same picture of holding fast. And what are we holding fast to? What do we, what do we, you know, we can, I can say we're holding, we're grasping onto God because we, we believe that he's our salvation, he's our refuge and strength. But Hebrews says, let us hold fast to the hope that we profess without wavering. And what is the hope? I mean, we, we can list a lot of things out of that hope. But he says, for he who promised is faithful. Again, I'm not just hoping I give you, I've given you guys the picture before. I love snow. There's another disappointment. We've gotten no snow this year. Yeah, thank you, God. The thing I love the most, God could just give us a few days of it, right? And he doesn't. See, I'm blaming God for it. You know, I, I'm, I hope that it snows tomorrow or I hope that it snows next week. That, that's a totally different kind of hope that we're talking about. And Hebrews is saying, hey, let's hold fast to the hope that we profess to have without wavering. And what's the hope that we Christians profess to have? It's we believe, we have a hope that it's God who promised us something is faithful. Stop crying, Ronnie. He's faithful to fulfill that promise. And it's these hopes that I keep showing you that just keep blowing my mind. That's what I keep telling you. The good news just keeps getting gooder. I'm not dumb, Charlie. I know that's bad English. I didn't know the difference. Oh, okay. That's right. You're from Chehalis. (laughs) Jeremiah says, but this is the covenant I will make. So this is the promise that God gives. From the beginning, in the middle, and to the end. He says, this is the covenant I will make. Because we think covenant. You know, even in the psalm passage that, we, uh, that Matt read earlier, it says, those who keep my covenant, and then it gives, it says whatever it said at the end. Well, not, um, I forget what it said, but those who keep my covenant. And again, in my mind, I keep thinking, that goes right to this obedience stuff, like fulfill, being obedient to God. But at its core, the covenant is this. This is the covenant I will make. I will be their God and they will be my people and they will all know me from the least of them to to the greatest. And how will they know him? They will know him as the God who is filled with loving kindness and everything that he does and allows to happen in our life. It's meant for our good and he's teaching us about him through everything and anything that we go through in this life. That's the main covenant, you guys, in all of Scripture. So this hope, this hope that we profess to have without wavering is that he who promised that is going to remain faithful in fulfilling that promise. The one who says he's going to save his people, he's going to be faithful in in fulfilling the promise to save his people. The one who says, I'm going to make you sons and daughters of me. I'm going to bring you to myself in eternity. He's the one that's going to fulfill that promise. So Hebrews, it's a it's, it's a phenomenal passage where he says, we hold fast to the hope that we profess. What's the hope that we profess? That, the, that he who promised is faithful to fulfill his promises. It's not my promise to God. It's God's promise to us. And it says, like I said, this is the covenant I'm going to make. I will be their God and they will be my people. It's the same words that he gave to Moses and the Israelites prior to bringing them out of Egypt. He says this over and over again throughout Scripture. I'm going to be their God, they will be my people, and they are going to know me as the good God who intends loving kindness and faithfulness to my people, from the least of them to the greatest. 
This is part of it. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 15. Look, I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. This is God's promise all the time. I'm with you. I'm for you. And I'm going to fulfill my promises to you. And you are going to, I, I, I'm going to persuade you. I'm going to cause you to know that I am good. Not just from an authority, I say that all the time, I don't know why I feel compelled to say that. Not just merely from some authoritative standpoint. Like, okay, you're finally going to know the right information. No, you're going to believe it. You're going to believe that God is good. And that everything that you've gone through in this life has been with the purpose of God teaching you about himself. Isaiah 41 says, For I am the Lord your God who takes a hold of, who fastens myself to your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. It's part of his promise. This is, this is part of that hope that we profess to believe. That God is going to fulfill this. That God is doing this. That he's actually holding on to me. And he says, you don't have to be afraid. And why? Because I'm going to help you. So that's kind of the foundation. That's the, that, that's the, those are the, the simplistic big ideas of, of what we believe regarding our foundation as a church and the basis for any activity that we have. So let me try to bring this home. Um, and This made sense in my head when I was thinking about this last night and this morning especially. But um, what does that look like in, in this little church in the woods? Because everything that I've said so far can be very meaningful it can be impactful, it can be life-changing um, for all of you in an individual kind of way. You, you can go home and never come back to our church and, and believe these things and, and benefit from them. But how, how does this tie together in, in kind of this idea of, uh, of a community of believers? It's interesting, as I, I was um, in my job in the military, I, I give training, I, I speak to soldiers and their family members about, um, about spiritual resiliency, about mental health, mental health issues. And uh, prior to, uh, to one of the trainings I did in eastern Washington last, uh, last summer, I found this, this document of, it's, it's, the, it's the, the U.S. Surgeon General, you guys can read it right up there, it says, calls for action regarding the ongoing epidemic of loneliness and isolation. Of course, after the epidemic of COVID, you know, everything's an epidemic now. Um, and we got all kinds of epidemics, and that, that word's almost overused. But it's, it, I, I've, I've been tracking kind of this idea for, for a lot of years, especially with what I, what I do with soldiers. So this idea of there's, a, there's an epidemic of loneliness and isolation, and there's a, there's a big document that you can find that the, the, the Surgeon General has out there, and, um, that's the picture of the document right there, our epidemic of loneliness and isolation. And uh, a quote out of, uh, from, from the Surgeon General uh, is this right here. It says, Our epidemic of loneliness and isolation has been an underappreciated public health crisis that has harmed individual and societal, societal health. Our relationships are a source of healing and well-being, hiding in plain sight, one that can help us live healthier, more fulfilled, and more productive lives. So it's interesting that, that on, the, uh, on the secular side, it has nothing to do with religion, not even like spiritual stuff. Regular secular psychology is coming to the epiphany that relationships and connection with other people are actually is actually something or are things that provide healing and benefit for people. 
that when left isolated and alone, and, and, and I don't mean that like from a literal standpoint, because what's happening in our society, and you can, you can just, I, just ask me if you want other quotes and documentation, but what, you, what you'll see is there's a lot of things written right now that are talking about how people, like you're a bunch of people that are, are you're not, you're not uh, isolated and alone right now, right? You're, you're with a group of people. But yet, this same group of people, there are, there are those of you within this group of people that feel like you're isolated and alone in your heads. And that's what's happening in society. That despite the fact that we're connected with all kinds of things, especially with social media right now, and allegedly we're, we're more connected to people than we ever have in, in, in the history of mankind. But yet what... what what psychologists are finding out, that we're more iso- people are more isolated and alone than they ever have been in their lives as far as their feeling and what they're experiencing. So what's that have to do with church? What's that have to do with activity? What's that have to do with our church? The dynamic in our church b- before, I know there's at least two people here that read ahead, I found out in Sunday school, so I'm I'm, I'm not showing that scripture passage. But what's interesting in our church and the dynamic that we've had here is that because of the, the seminary, that the training that I've received, that Jeff had received, we both went to the master's seminary, there, there has been this belief that people that usually um, are, are able to find this church in the woods through the master's seminary website, and there's a belief that, that we preach the gospel here, that we have... There's good teaching that they can find here. And there's, there's this interesting dynamic that I've found um, with, and, and I'm, I'm part of this, so I'm not, this isn't meant as condemnation, but what, we've, what I've experienced at our church is that typically, and I, I should say include with this idea of like fundamentalist conservative Baptist churches, is that typically there can be a uh, an aura of isolationism in, in in the individual families and people in that 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 people have a very passionate view of what the gospel is and what teaching and preaching should be and, and they're the in essence the little authorities in their life that determine what teaching and preaching that they get and they're very isolationist in their activity. And because we're a church in the woods, we typically just have our activity in which we, we meet on Sunday mornings. And, and, and there can be this feeling of, like, we're a community of believers, but not really. Like, we don't really know each other. We live far apart. We don't have other typical ministries, which, again, there can be good ministries, obviously, good programs that churches do, but we don't, we don't have any of those. And so we've always kind of been battling this um, like connection but disconnection within our own church. And part of that has to do with just the makeup of the, up of the people. That it, we, all of us have our, um, and when I say fundamentalist Christians, you know, we, and I can think of the olden days, when I was a little kid, you know, that um, fundamentalist Christians have ideas of what's appropriate. What's appropriate to wear, what's appropriate to watch, homeschool or public school. I mean, there's all kinds of really um, passionate, good things that I don't have a problem with. But what happens in, in a church like this is that, that we remain kind of isolated from each other for a lot of different reasons. And so, especially in our church out here, we've, we've kind of not made... Don't, I don't want to call it a next step because... I. It's okay with me if you only come to this church just to hear the teaching. That's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that. So again, this isn't a condemning thing. I just want to kind of bring to mind, hey, what is activity with a community of believers? What, what, how do you church? That's, I'm getting back, to the, that, back around to bookending the beginning of the sermon. How do you church? How are you churching today? Is it merely just to be here and, and listen to the gospel, to be encouraged. And that's good. That's fine. But is that all that church entails? 
I want to present to you or read to you another passage in Hebrews. It says, let us hold fast. This is the, the, the whole passage of that, that um, the verse I read earlier. It says, let us hold fast to the hope that we profess without wavering for he who promised us, or he who promised is faithful. So we've, we've already covered that extensively with great passion. So we believe that, that God is going to fulfill his promises to us. So that's the foundation. But then look at how, how the writer of Hebrews talks about the activity that comes as a result of that. So he says, let us, and this is, he's talking to a community of believers, a group of people that aren't just isolated in their, in their couches at home. It says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. Let us not neglect meeting together. I know some of you good church people would have said that earlier when I said, hey, why do you come to church? Well, scripture tells us to not neglect meeting with each other. So that's why I'm here. Well, is that good for you? I, I, sorry, I can go, I can go down along um, tangents with that. So you're just going to meet together because it says meet together? There's a purpose to it. There's a reason for it. And it says, hey, th- let's not neglect meeting together as some have made it a habit, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So again, how do we church? Again, whether you go to this church again or not, this this applies to you no matter where you're at. You can remain in your living room and listen to good teaching. You can be a Christian that's holding fast to God. I'm, I'm, no, I didn't ask you a question. Um, see what technology does sorry they, my, Siri or somebody was answering me on my phone um, oh shoot <laughs> completely lost my train of thought let us hold fast the hope that we profess without uh, wavering for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another and to love, to love and good deeds. And, and even that, the stirring up one another to love and good deeds, the love and good deeds is, is still based on the foundation of this idea that, there were, that we're helping each other remember that God is good. That we're helping each other and encouraging each other to wait on or to grasp a hold of God in everything that we do. So he says, let's not neglect meeting together as some have made it a habit, but let's encourage one another all the more as you see this day approaching. I, I, I wrote, this is how I bookend it. Why church? Why are you churching today? How are you churching today? And again, there's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer. It's different for every family. It's, it is different. I mean, sure, could we, could we make some, um, could, could we agree on certain things that we believe that Scripture points us to, like getting together on a Sunday morning? Sure, I'm not saying that that's, that's not the case. I'm saying that God has us all on, on different journeys, on different roads, I, I kind of put this here too just to, to kind of give a plug that, that we need help at our church. One, we need help in the sense of connecting with one another. Being a connected community of believers that, that is doing what Hebrews is talking about. That is stirring uh, each other up toward love and good deeds. Encouraging one another. And that, that can look different in a, in a lot of different ways. I mean, I'm encouraged when you just show up to church. For real. It does sound funny, but I am. So there's encouragement that way. But we are a small church that kind of has been, um, uh, I don't know if I would say um, reluctant, but because many folks that come to our church uh, kind of look at programs and ministries kind of in a bad light, and it's not that I, want to, I don't want to create a bunch of things, But what does it look like to you to stir one another up toward love and good deeds? To encourage one another? To be in relationship to one another? What does that look like when we we ask that question of, you know, why church? Why are you churching today? What does churching look like as we move forward here in this church? There's a lot of other ways to encourage. I mean, like I said, we need a lot of help at our church. It's 
It's, um, it's being run by a lot of people that are just volunteering their times, their time. We need help in the, with the kids during Sunday school and Sunday morning. Rose is dying for help with snacks after church on Sunday. You each have your own likes or passions as far as where God has, um, how God has shaped and formed you as far as um, giving you compassion for certain people. That perhaps we, we could be a ministry, we could, we could be encouraging and, and having purposeful activities in some kind of outreach. But again, I'm not one just to create outreach to create outreach. I want to do something that's organic to to us as a community of believers. I want, I want to be able to meet a need of people who are in need. What does it mean? Why do we give money to church? Is that part of churching? What do we do with our money here at this church? And part of, these, part of the reason why I'm just throwing this out here is because I, I want to tackle this you know, over the course of the next year. Um, just to, and, and I'm almost done. Just as a brief, tiny history um after covid uh and then after jeff and the pierce family leaving we didn't know if we would be able to stay functioning as a, as a church as far as we didn't know if we had a viable group of people that we could maintain uh this church financially uh and otherwise and what has been really encouraging to see is that we are able to do that there are people here that believe that you're part of this community of believers in whatever way that looks to you. We're able to continue to, to fund the building, to fund our activities. And is there more? And what does that look like here at this church? So as we kind of end the sermon today with this slide up, it says, Why church? Why are you churching today? I, I, want, I just want to leave you with that. What is church to you? How do you understand it? I hope it can be challenging to you in a way. How are you involved? There's so many people that leave our church, and, and that's okay too, but they leave because they're looking for something else. They're looking for some kind of connection. They're looking for some kind of, maybe it's something for their kids. But consistently, we haven't had people that said, you know what? Here's what I think I want. Here's, here's what I think is appropriate activity in the church. How can I be a part of that here? How can I be a solution to that? And maybe you're a solution to that in a different church, and that's okay too. But um, I've been encouraged. I've been encouraged by uh, the scripture passages that we've been in. I've been encouraged with, with just looking at, uh, again, the, our, our, our foundation, just kind of re-looking at uh, what we believe is our foundation, and, and then what drives our activity. So I hope that's encouraging to you.